We will get started in just a few seconds as people keep signing in. So nice to see all these fun attendee names popping up. Okay. Hi everyone, thank you all so much for joining and welcome to this week's Entwine exclusive. Uh, my name is Ariel Sokoloff and I'm the Senior Engagement Manager at JDC Entwine. For those of you who don't know us yet, uh, Entwine is the young adult platform of JDC, the Joint Distribution Committee, which is the world's leading Jewish humanitarian organization operating in over 70 countries worldwide. Entwine exclusive is a weekly series that was created to give people a behind the scenes look at how JDC responds to global crises and help you feel connected to the global Jewish world. Just a few housekeeping tips. Um, we're going to be monitoring the Q&A here on Zoom. We also have some people joining us on Facebook Live um, and we have somebody there who will monitor the comments. Uh, and we're gonna have some time uh, to answer some questions at the end of the session. This week's featured speaker is going to be interviewed by Entwine's own Andrew Bellenfont, who's our Director of Engagement. Andrew, thank you so much for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Ariel. I'm uh, excited to introduce Josh, who is really the featured speaker of today. I just get to sort of be the, the Anderson Cooper to his amazing content that he's going to be uh, sharing with all of you in the world. Um, Josh Yudkin is currently our uh, Ralph Goldman Fellow. Um, this fellowship is um, one of our, our favorite and most special fellowships, and it's awarded to one person annually. Um, and it's pretty amazing that this year's uh, Ralph Goldman Fellow, Josh, actually also happens to be an epidemiologist. Um, so what an opportunity for Josh to be able to um, work on a lot of our responses to what's happening in the world right now, which we are going to get to do a deep dive into. So Josh is currently based in Israel, and, and while normally the Ralph Goldman Fellow travels to a few different countries abroad, um, he has stayed there to really work on the task force that's really responding to the corona and COVID-19. Um, so Josh, thank you for being with us today. I thought we, we would start by you just telling us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks so much for organizing this and having it. I'm really excited to see so many familiar names and people and get to be sharing this experience with everyone. Um, a little bit about me, I'm from Dallas, Texas originally. Uh, I went to Washington University in St. Louis for my undergraduate and master's degrees. And I'm currently pursuing a PhD in epidemiology, like Andrew said, at the University of Texas um, in Dallas. And uh, I guess between going to WashU and Texas, you know, I worked in a various uh, settings, private public sectors and whatnot. Um, but, you know, I think kind of background on the health side, I had the opportunity, uh, you know, I've been connected to a clinic in Mexico for about 12 years that works in the rural part of northern Mexico, uh, looking at chronic conditions and eye and eye surgeries. I did some really interesting work in southern India, looking at Tamil Nadu at cardiovascular disease and how it disproportionately is affecting some of the rural communities there. Um, and I recently just found out actually uh, the work I've been doing in Colombia just got a Fulbright for next year. So we'll be doing some research looking with their Ministry of Health there. Um, That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that. I, I learned actually about the Joint Distribution Committee, uh, the JDC, when I was working at Hillel's International Office as a Chief of Staff. Um, and I was really amazed to find this Jewish organization that was so aligned with so many of my own interests that I had actually never even heard of before. Um, so, you know, to find an organization that was really working on a global level with community development and building resilient communities, public health, education, Jewish identity um, was really inspiring. Uh, and so when I found out about it, I learned a little more and I applied and was lucky enough to actually be selected to go on an Entwine experience to Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and since then I've stayed involved and I was able to chair trips to Cuba and Rwanda. And now I get to serve as the Ralph I. Goldman Fellow for the year. Thanks. Thanks for the for the intro and the background on who you are and, and what you're doing. Tell us, I, I know I sneak peeked this by saying that you are currently in Israel, but tell us like what's happening on the ground and what's the reality there and, and what are you like, what are you experiencing? Yeah, um, Israel's always a dynamic and exciting place to be. So uh, excited to share a little from my, my very limited sliver here. Um, like you said, I'm based in Tel Aviv right now. Um, so I'd say it's really, it's a mix of realities. Um, 
I think it's also a fairly dynamic reality that's changing from day to day. So I'd say on one hand, the streets are fairly empty. Uh, generally, people are self-quarantining um, per the advice of the government and whatnot, um, to the point that even family members that are living in the same city just a few you know, blocks uh, uh, away from each other are really not even visiting each other. Um, I think a lot of people, especially in bigger cities like Tel Aviv, have actually gone back to family homes um, in other parts of the country, like, you know, to the Ramata Golan in the north and whatnot, to really be able to, to be with family. Um, but at the same time, you know, per the guidelines, you can engage in sport as long as you're, uh, as long as you're less than five in a group and more than two meters apart. So personally, at least for the past week or so, um, I've been finding my calm and my escape going for a nice run on the beach. And when it is sunny, that place is pretty packed. But uh, as of exactly an hour ago, they changed the guidelines and you're only allowed now within uh, 100 meters of your, your home. So I'm not sure how, how feasible that's going to be for a run anymore. Um, You'll just run in circles around your apartment building. <laughs> right, exactly. I think actually there was, a, there was a clip about someone in Italy who ran a marathon in one place or something. So I think people are getting very innovative as to how they're getting their <laughs> in homework on uh, But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think, you know, like most places, you know, I think professionally, you know, I was on a conference call earlier and um, one of my colleagues in Modi'in, she's like, I apologize for joining so out of breath and hyperventilating. Um, but I was just doing Zumba with my kids to keep them entertained. So I think there's definitely a work-life balance challenge that we're seeing um, around the globe. And, um, you know, I think, I think the funniest one or the most interesting one was somebody, uh, every, every video conference call we've had for the past two weeks, a colleague's been in her car uh, because there's not a quiet space at home since so many people in the home are on conference calls. So she has designated her car as her, as her conference call space. So I think people are pretty flexible and I think they're, you know, in many ways, the Israeli mindset is, is, is lending itself to, to, to handling the unique situation. Um, but besides, you know, really that educating and engaging children at home, um, I think it's really, you know, there was this interview I heard on the news a couple days ago, and it was someone who grew up in Tel Aviv, and I was raising a family in Tel Aviv, and he said, you know, I've lived through many operations and many wars, many terrorist bombings and, and, and whatnot in the city, and I've never been in the city before, no matter what the fear was, where they literally shut the whole city down. And so I think in many ways, uh, it's a familiar, but it's definitely a new reality. Mm. Yeah, and I think testing people's ability to be resilient. I think one of the things we'll learn from this is how we actually unify in community amidst all this sort of um, isolation and, and distancing. For sure. Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, as Ariel introed so beautifully when we started the call, uh, JDC is actually responding to, to crises all over the world. Um, and this one is, is not exempt from that in any way. So wanted to hear from you about what are some of the challenges you're actually seeing in Jewish communities globally right now? Yeah, great question. I think probably the most perhaps physical or obvious challenge that I think Jewish communities are facing, um, Jewish peoplehood I think is based around coming together to celebrate good times and bad times. Uh, so what happens when we like physically can't actually gather together? So I think, you know, there's been everything from you know, online uh, minions that have been happening. Um, but I think, you know, I think the biggest question that people are facing today is what about Pesach? You know, how do we have a Seder, you know, when we can't all gather around the same table together and, and tell the story? So um, I think that's probably the, the, the most tangible question. Um, you know, I think another question kind of on an organizational level is uh, who do we um, as local and national, perhaps even international Jewish organizations prioritize what do we as local, national, and international Jewish organization, organizations prioritize? Um, and how does this virus really change our priorities? Um, and I think, you know, kind of thinking about in light of this pandemic, where, where does that put us? Um, and probably the last question or that, that I think it's raising is, or the, the biggest challenge is in many ways, I'd say the pandemic, um, it's a new experience for the organized Jewish community because, you know, I think the Jewish community and Jewish communities have done an amazing job. Um, we always come together and we rally, you know, for the good, for the bad, for celebrations, but also, you know, against anti-Semitic activity, terrorist attack, any challenges that have been affecting our community, but also even supporting other communities um, that have experienced, you know, repression, xenophobia, and other situations. And so I think really, how does the Jewish communities or community come together to support such a universal issue? And I think that question has been the one that's resonated with me the most. And I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, 
And I think kind of in the same way that the virus does not discriminate, um, I don't think really our response as a Jewish community should either. And, you know, there's this, there's this phrase, especially, um, I know at any point we talk a lot about that says, Ko Yisrael Aravim Zebazah, which means that, you know, all of Israel is responsible for one another. And I think if anything, um, it's in times like this where we really shouldn't be so myopic in our thinking and we should be reminded of the global Jewish community and how uh, we really need to be acting together and acting for all. Yeah, I think, I think you're actually highlighting something really powerful, which is that there are so many situations we encounter in the world which actually show our differences. And this one is one that is showing our similarities. And so your question around what does it mean to come together on something that really is affecting and impacting everyone is a really powerful one. And thinking about this as a universal issue is really important during this time. Tell us like, let's just take a step like out for one second. Tell us like, what are some of the bright spots in all of this? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think there's always, there's always beautiful things that happen, I think, in times of crisis, which in challenging times. And I think definitely here in Israel, but I've heard stories about this in other communities around the world as well. Um, I think, you know, youth are going around and they're volunteering and taking food to elderly or people that may not have families and supporting them. Um, you know, I can tell you here in Israel, I was just talking with a friend who lives with his grandmother in Tel Aviv. And he's been going couch surfing for the past couple of weeks because it's so important for him to not be at home and potentially infect his grandmother. Um, so he's been really staying with friends because he's really trying to do everything he can to take care of you know, more vulnerable populations. And I think it's kind of those small actions, those things that on one level are, are fairly individualized, but on one level are so symbol symbolic and I think really representing the way people are going above and beyond to take care of the people they care about. And even complete strangers, I think, speaks so loudly. Um, you know, I think on a, on a more macroscopic level, uh, I think it's watching people put their Jewish values into practice professionally as well. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the amazing opportunities I have as the Ralph I. Goldman Fellow for the year is to be able to work with different teams at the, at the joint, at the JDC. And, um, you know, I think right now I'm working with the, the grid team. Um, and that's a team that works primarily with, uh, you know, non-sectarian communities around the world. And we've been doing a lot of work looking at, uh, about how to support, you know, communities in Ethiopia. And I think just like the rich discussion and the thoughtfulness and the intentionality that the team really employs when thinking about, you know, what does it mean to really focus on vulnerable populations and the moral obligation, focus on the poor of the poor, how we can really be there and set an example, and it's not just a quick fix, but it's really setting the stage for a sustainable intervention that's gonna help people. Um, and I think, you know, especially dear to my heart and my research that I've done previously is, how are we doing it in a way that is, um, it's, it's in line with the community needs and what the community's articulated. And so it's, it's working with on the ground partners and asking them, what do you see? It's talking to the government and saying, what are your needs? And um, I think it's really doing it in a way that's not only culturally tailored for, for their needs, ling language and, and whatnot, but also in a way that's respectful and in accordance with how they prioritize their own community needs. Mm. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think lastly, also just, you know, going to a totally different region of the world, this was, this was two weeks ago, was, uh, you know, I think in terms of organizational planning um, in the former Soviet Union, you know, so this is a region where, uh, where they're working all the way over from Belarus and Moldova to Tajikistan, uh, you know, there's a question of how do you support employees? How do you support clients? How do you support communities? And how do you do it in ways where you're not, um, you're not, you're not necessarily uh, preventing communities from coming together, but you're supporting them doing it in a safe way, in a way that's healthy and respectful of everyone. Um, and I just think that like, the thoughtful, again, like the thoughtfulness and the difficult decisions and the way that it's being made in accordance with local partners, I think is just, it's, it's, it's really impressive. Yeah, and in line with a lot of the way that JDC does its work anyway. So I think one of the things that's, that's become really important is, is ensuring that the values and commitments we make organizationally are consistent regardless of whatever we're responding to. And I think some of the locations that you highlighted are really important. Are there any like specific examples of things happening in each of those places you could you could like share you know a sentence or two about quickly before we move to our next question? Yeah, um, I think uh, for for Ethiopia, you know, I think there's this question of um, you know where do you intervene? And so I guess when I put my kind of epidemiology hat on for a second, we always say there's kind of three levels of prevention. There's primary prevention, 
there's secondary prevention, and there's tertiary prevention. So primary prevention in my brain is kind of your classic prevention. That's your, like, we should wash our hands, we should create social distancing. Your mm -hmm. secondary prevention is your testing, and the tertiary prevention is how are you treating and providing the care for people that have already been infected with the disease. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like a really difficult question in terms of with limited resources and limited access, you know, where do you prioritize that? Um, and I think, you know, at least for, for where we're sitting in terms of the work in Ethiopia, I think we, you know, did, uh, made a decision that the two places where we could intervene most strategically was in that kind of primary prevention and that tertiary prevention. So um, I can tell you the hospital and Addis, you know, as of a few days ago, at least they said that they had, um, I think out of the 500 possible beds that were possibly able to use to treat uh, coronavirus positive patients, only 90 of them were ready to be used. And so there's a question of how do we make sure that the other 410 beds are available? I think in terms of prevention, you know, there were hospital, uh, there were healthcare centers that said that they didn't have hand sanitizer to use between patients. And there are definitely areas that don't have running water with hand, uh, you know, for hand washing. And so I think right. we're really going in trying to figure out how do we provide, you know, the best way for people as lay individuals to engage in hand washing, for professionals to be able to keep, you know, uh, use hand sanitizer and, and clean between patient visits and really make sure the hospital's up and ready because while there's only a few cases in Ethiopia, um, we can expect the number to grow pretty rapidly in the next little bit. Yeah, as it has in, in so many places globally. Um, and I think if we do some of this early prevention now, it'll help us to, to not get to the place where other countries have. For sure. Yeah, you spoke, so you spoke a lot about um, working in tandem with local communities as being a primary value that guides you um, and, and certainly guides the work that we're doing organizationally. Wanted to hear from you a little bit about like, what is a Jewish value that's actually guiding you right now? Huh. Yeah, it's a good question. I think there's so many Jewish values at play right here. I think every discussion is like inherently embedded with Jewish values and, and really like, you know, rich tradition. Um, yeah, all of the Jewish values are guiding us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I would say, you know, if I were to take two of them and kind of put them together as, you know, opposite sides of the same coin, I would say it's probably pikuach nefesh and um, tikkun olam. So pikuach nefesh would be, you know, one's obligation to save a life. Um, and tikkun olam would be, you know, repairing the world is how we kind of tra uh, traditionally translate it. Um, in terms of the former for pikuach nefesh, you know, there's this saying that we love to use, which is, he who saves just one life, it's as if he saved the world. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it, it's our job to protect each other. Um, and in fact, like, you know, it's, it falls, the responsibility falls not just on healthy people um, who are not immunocompromised, typically younger, to be able to, to, to follow the guidelines. Um, and really, you know, create the social distancing, but it's also on, um, you know, it, it's also for vulnerable populations to, to, to be able to take care of themselves and, and take that extreme precaution at home. And so I think it's really on the entire community to work together and make sure that we're doing what we can to, to help each other um, and creating a safe space. Uh, there's this quote, uh, which is actually from Pierre K. Avot, which I think we are about to post. Yeah, we just posted great into the group chat. Um, yeah, so for people who are on the call, Pierre K. Avot translates to the ethics of our fathers. Exactly, yeah. So it's, this, it's a Jewish text, Ethics of Our Fathers. Um, it's a lot of rabbinic teachings. And there's this one, if you want to find it, it's chapter 3, um, verse 22. And uh, the text is right there, so I'll give everyone a chance to read through it. Um, but basically, at its core, if you don't have a chance to read through it, it's this discussion that says, um, you know, it's, it's a metaphor of a tree, and it says which one's more important, the branches or the roots? And the, the rabbis interpret it as the branches as knowledge and the roots are, are actions. And at the core of its teaching, it says, you know, at least I interpret it by saying that Judaism is about action. Um, it inspires us to act, um, to, to, to act. And so for me, I think professionally, it's really inspiring to work to combat the spread of coronavirus through my work with the JDC. Um, but I also think on a personal level, right, it inspires us to make sure that just because we can walk outside and we can go to places doesn't mean we should. And how do we really, you know, intentionally be inactive and take that step to make sure we're protecting everyone in our community as well. Um, just a quick note, I guess, on the flip side of the coin for Tikkun Olam, you know, I think on one hand, we're totally responding to this new concept, this new phenomenon that's happening today. Um, but I, I guess I just want to pose the question and think about you know, where is this going to put us in the future? And so uh, I was reading a paper, a big uh, leading paper from the U.S. today, and the journalist referred to the corona pandemic as a test of national character. Um, but I find that really ironic because there's really no, nothing national about this experience. 
Um, in fact, I think it's a completely international experience and I think it transcends all national and international and supranational bodies that exist out there. And this is really about us coming together globally to be able to combat uh, what's affecting everyone. And so um, I guess I hope that as we, as we see, as we curb the, the pandemic and we kind of move post pandemic, I'd love for us to kind of come together as we have so many times before after other pandemics and other global challenges I'm um, gonna really think about how we're working to make the world a better place and in a better place than where we started. Mm. There are like uh, 500 threads to follow with all of the brilliant wisdom you just shared with us. Um, um, one thing that I, I'll just reflect on really quickly is when you spoke about um, saving one life, meaning that we have the opportunity to save the whole world. I actually like, I've seen that text many times in my life and right now that actually it like as you spoke it out loud it really struck me in, a, in such a powerful way to really think about what it actually means for us to take personal responsibility for the world there's there's something incredible about this being an opportunity for that and so i wanted to just thank you for that wisdom and, and for giving us new meaning to an ancient jewish text given the circumstances we're living in uh, the tail end of what you spoke about was really about what does it actually mean to be responsible for global communities uh, you made a really clear point of saying this isn't just about our national crisis, but it's also an international crisis and that we all are responsible for people all over the world, not just the people in our local communities. So I wanted to pose to you, you know, at a time when we're all forced physically to stay very local to the communities that we live in and the communities that we're a part of, how can we care for the global Jewish world? What does it actually mean to take on that responsibility? And, and what can we be doing to support the global Jewish community right now? Yeah, I think it can mean a lot of things. <laughs> I think that's a big question in and of itself. Um, yeah, I'm only gonna give you tough questions today, so. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, you know, I think, I, think, I think it's a super, uh, I, I think it's a super individualized question. Um, I think for me, and I hope maybe this will resonate with some people, uh, we, live, we live in kind of, there's this great term, and at least they use a lot of times in uh, healthcare research, global, where it's like global, but also local. So talk about like obesity is a global issue. So I think we live in this kind of global, localized world, um, where through just day-to-day -day interactions, business, culture, you know, trade, et cetera, we're all, we're all interconnected. Um, you know, I think I said this before, but the, but the virus, the coronavirus doesn't discriminate against one nation versus the other. Um, I think both in terms of its like biophysiological impact on the body, but also in terms of its like societal impact, like what it's doing to people. So, um, you know, I guess I would just, I would, I would, I would ask us, or I wonder, you know, if we could employ empathy um, for each other and kind of think about how we're all having a very similar experience simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd want us to ask questions because as much as it's a similar experience, it's unique. It's unique for everybody around the, the world. And so I think being able to have that empathy that says we're all going through a similar experience, but having the interest and, and bandwidth to be there to support people as their experience might be slightly different than you. Um, you know, this is an Entwine uh, Zoom Facebook live uh, session. So I think it would be remiss not to take the opportunity. I'm sitting here and, you know, I'm thinking there's like this amazing network of Entwine people out there. Um, you know, I think for me, like, I'm just thinking of people from previous trips I've, I've been with that have been everywhere from, you know, New York to right here in Israel to Lithuania, Hungary, other locations as well. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's taking out your phone and sending them a WhatsApp and being like, hey, how are you? It's a Facebook message saying, thinking of you, you know, and just checking in and seeing how people are doing and asking that question. Um, you know, I think for many people that have had the opportunity to visit some of the amazing communities in which the JDC works, um, whether it's the former Soviet Union or other parts of the world, um, think about the home care worker who who's, you know, spends their day, you know, traveling four hours by car to visit a person who can't get out of bed and make sure they're okay, to make sure they have their needs met. Um, and send them a text message and say, thank you. I know this is a really difficult time. And I wanted to say, I was thinking of you. Ask if there's anything you can do. Um, you know, I think I think it's it's that it's that opportunity to to reach out to people, make them feel heard make us feel connected and, and know that despite the physical challenges, we're, we're all here together in, in one community. Mm -hmm. should, we, should we pause for 30 seconds for everybody to pull out their phones and just text someone they're thinking about? Love it. All right, I'm counting down the clock, 30 seconds. Everybody pull out your phones right now and you're gonna text someone that you are thinking about or that you care about or that you wanna send some love or empathy to. And Josh and I are also gonna pull out our phones. I'm on my phone right here. Nice.
nice. So I'm going to bring us back together. Thank you. Thank you all for indulging in that. Um, and, and thank you, Josh, for the call to really be thinking about people. I think there's something really powerful about the global and local interchange that's happening where we can be thinking about the people globally, but actually treating them as if they're right there with us. And so, so thank you for that, for that charge. I um, was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, you started to share some things about the former Soviet Union. If you could talk a little bit about some of the work that you are thinking about with the, the larger JDC task force in terms of responding in the former Soviet Union? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I, if I can just take a second to give some background for people that may not be as familiar, um, the, the work of the JDC in the former Soviet Union is, is expansive. Um, I mean, I think that it's it, it arguably it might be one of the areas in the world in which we have the most complex and robust operation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I'd say everything from um, chesed to the JCC. So, I mean, there's, there's things where there are community centers where Jewish life is happening. There's co-curricular programming. There's Torah study, young adult engagement that's happening. But there's also, um, I think, one of the few places in the world where JDC is actually involved in direct service, which means that there are social workers going out to visit people. There are food that's being delivered. Um, and it's, 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 a very, it's a very comprehensive operation. And so, um, you know, I can tell you that there is a, t a team sitting there to uh, that was really looking at kind of the, both the scope of operation and the depth of operation and thinking through what what needs to happen in, in order to keep operations happening in these regions given the fact the coronavirus is mm -hmm. spreading and this started before there were actually cases reported in most of these countries and so you know i can tell you strategically there was a matrix that was built and kind of created a triage level of if this level this level this level how are operations going to be affected and I can mm -hmm. tell you, there was a lot of effort that was put in. And unfortunately, we jumped from about level one to level three or four very quickly. And so I think, you know, what we're seeing is, is that like, you know, the, the, the virus spreads very quickly and, and it, it impacts programming. I think in the same way questions about how do we have a Pesach Seder uh, happen when people can't gather? I think that's a real question in a region like that. I can tell you personally, you know, I was, I was potentially going to be going to Kharkov and maybe helping... Um, a partnership they have with, uh, that JDC has with the HUC in facilitating a Pesach Seder. And I think at this point it, it, it got canceled just because of the, the coronavirus. Wow. And so I think when, when you know, partners and, 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 and agents on the ground are unable to actually be there, there's a question of what services can be provided. I think on the flip side, right, there's a question of, um, we wanna make sure we're doing good and not harm. And so while, you know, there was extreme energy and eagerness by, you know, home care visits, uh, home care workers to make visits, there was a real question that says, we're not so worried about the employee uh, getting coronavirus from a bedridden bed individual, but how do we make sure that the employee who's taking all the precautions available doesn't inadvertently bring coronavirus to the clients in the area? So mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think, I think it's, it's a level of scope, it's a level of, of, of scale, but I think the same questions that are being, uh, you know, wrestled with there are happening in other areas of the world as well just on a, on a different in a different manner yeah and yeah and as you're speaking i'm even just thinking about how how grateful or lucky i feel that we get to even do this work and so um or that we even get to have these conversations so thank you for that um so we are living in an age uh, for a lot of different reasons where people are spending a lot of time on their phones now because they're they're stuck at home you see various things online and, and text message groups and, and memes that are popping up all over the place. Sort of wanted to throw it to you, like what are the things you actually, given everything you shared with us, what are the things you wish people were talking about right now? What conversations should people be having given, should people be having given the mediums that we're, we're being, you know, forced to use at the current moment in time? Yeah. Um, hmm. I think there's two ways maybe I'd answer your question. One's directly about the technology. I think one's just in general. In response to the technology, right, I think you're, you hit it spot on. We're, we're living in this, like, digital age of, like, every interpersonal relationship, for the most part, except for the people under the same roof of you, is, is, is through digital mediums. And so, you know, I think on one hand, it's amazing, and it's really fun to have these Zoom happy hours um, that we're doing, you know, potentially with work colleagues or, you know, friends or whatnot. But, um, and they're definitely Insta-worthy posts. Let's not forget that. Uh, but is that is that I went to three zoom birthday parties this weekend I'll just uh, say that out loud and it was actually great because I got to go to all three which I normally wouldn't have been able to do <laughs> your social calendar is much busier than mine Andrew so that's <laughs> <laughs> I'll invite you next time Josh thanks um, no but I think there's a question right of like is is that meeting our, our need as individuals to have that connection 
And so on one hand, I think it's amazing the platforms we have and the, the, the breadth of connections we can have. Um, but I would question like, what's the depth of that relationship we're looking for as well. Um, and so I guess I just would like kind of, you know, want to take a moment so that we can all make sure that we're taking the time to reflect and public, you know, and, and personally reflect and say like, what are our needs and articulate them to those that are close to us to make sure that we're making sure that our mental health is in a place where mm. we're doing okay and that we're, 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 we're in a place where we can be able to give to others as well. Um, I think a piece in terms of like all the digital kind of news and, and things that are going around, something that I don't think has been talked about that I think is a really neat story that I hope people might consider thinking about at least sharing is, um, so we were talking about the prevention before that kind of primary prevention, hand washing, hygiene, I think, is one of those is kind of key a key piece of that strategy. Um, I think that's kind of what I was sharing. You know, JDC is leading in, in, in Ethiopia right now with some of our partners. Um, but I think we forget sometimes that one risk factor or one activity actually has impacts on so many other things as well, and it can improve really the quality of life and life expectancy for people across the globe. Um, so you know, whether it's UNICEF or the World Health Organization, there's a lot of reports that have talked about how anywhere between hundreds of thousands to millions of children die per year in diarrheal diseases. And you know, many of those can be prevented simply by engaging in healthy hand washing practices. And so I think, you know, on one hand, coronavirus is definitely this like threat. It's like an imminent threat today and it's something that we're all dealing with today. And it's definitely what's precluding us from returning to normalcy today. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it's important to think about how us addressing these risk factors today is gonna have such long-term effects and improving both not only the quality of life, but the life expectancy for so many, you know, hundreds, if not uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of children and adults around the world. Mm. Thanks. Um, so, so we have been taking some questions from the audience and our team on the, on the back end here, um, which I want to express eternal gratitude for is pulling some of the questions. We're going to try and answer as many as possible. Um, and they are coming up on my screen as we're speaking. So wanted to, to throw it out to you from the audience. In terms of JDC's work right now and current response to coronavirus, what are we all most proud of? What are you feeling most proud of? Wow, I think, you know, I think it's, I, th I think it's so easy to get stuck in our own bubbles. And it's so easy to be sitting here and thinking about how, um, you know, my life has been impacted and how, you know, you're, you're in this uncomfortable, perhaps discomfort, you know, situation of discomfort. Um, but I think the more people I've interacted with, the more gratitude I've been hearing. And I think people being grateful for the friends and the families that are checking in on them, whether it's like the number of FaceTime or Zoom dates they have set up just to, you know, people that care about them. Um, or it's like appreciation of the fact that like, I can walk to the grocery store and I don't have to worry about food. You know, I can make sure that I can have, you know, a meal, you know, on the table for my kids. I think there's so many people that have really kind of spun this experience and said, you know what, it sucks. And in many ways it does. But I think there are so many people out there that are really just, you know, propagating and emphasizing the, the, their gratefulness. And I think for me, that's like such an encouragement and such a great feeling to hold on to because I think it's so easy to get down. And I think it's really just powerful to, to, to hold on to those small moments of, of gratitude. Yes, yes, we all, we should all hold on to that gratitude and, and take moments to reflect on that throughout the day. Um, this, one, this one came up and it was sort of already answered, but if you wanna add anything to it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you uh, answer it. The, the question is how, how you think JDC has been proactive rather than reactive in responding to the circumstances. Yeah, I think, um, I think JDC has a really dynamic role depending on the region of the world. And so in some parts of the world, so like for example in Israel, JDC is a convener of, of organizations that are really working on social, uh, social and welfare programs. I think mm -hmm. like I said in the FSU, JDC takes more of a direct service role. Um, I think in, you know, Africa and other areas where the grid team works, they really kind of work on like the disaster relief and kind of looking at it from afar and empowering local organizations to do it. So on one hand, I'll say the response has been entirely contingent upon the role JDC plays in that region. So I'm not sure that there's like a specific, specific answer, but I will say some general trends that I've seen from my limited vantage point, um, is I think everybody from the second it broke out in China was like, we need to start thinking about this and we need to start thinking about what we need to do. Um, I think everyone's kind of been trying to create emergency plans and they've been doing it in tandem with people on the ground in their regions. And I think everyone's trying to do it in a way that both follows international um, guidelines and recommendations, but also in terms of what the community articulated as their needs. 
Um, and so mm -hmm. I think for me, you know, I don't, I don't think there's a singular response, but I think those are kind of some, some, some general uh, theories or, or, or guiding principles JDC has employed in terms of their response across the globe. Got it. Thank you. Um, so we, we have a question here that I think is, is really reminiscent of, of things that you said earlier in the call about what does it actually mean to care for people. And someone is really concerned about the babushkas in the former Soviet Union. And so there's a question here um, in response to the work that you spoke about in the FSU. Uh, someone who really wants to know how are the babushkas in the FSU doing? Um, how, are they, how are they feeling? They depend on our help. What is, the, what is it like for them right now? It's a good question. I could give a brief answer, but I feel like maybe the better answer, Andrew, would be for us to like go back to the field and actually see if we could get some testimonies and share that with people so that we're not just kind of giving the thousand foot view, but we can let people hear directly from what people there are experiencing. I love that. You responded with your own call to action for caring for people individually and giving people real, real answers. So I am making a commitment and Josh is making a commitment and Ariel's making a commitment right now on the call to do some follow up with everybody who's joined us today on, on how the Babishkas are doing. For sure. Cool. Um, so a question here about Israel. Um, it, in the US, we're seeing a large rate of infections amongst um, Orthodox communities and so um, wanted to hear if you know anything about how the Orthodox community in Israel is doing. Um, I don't know if you, if you know so much about that, but wanted to, to bring that question up since someone asked it in the, in the Q&A. Yeah, I haven't had so much firsthand exposure in Tel Aviv to the Orthodox community, um, but I can say there was an article I read this morning, actually, and they were kind of breaking through, they were breaking down um, where the point of infection was in the cases within Israel. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I don't know who asked the question, but it's actually, it, it's weird that I have these numbers in my head, but at least according to this article and this morning, they said that I believe it was 29% of cases in Israel had a point of infection in a shul and 5% were in a yeshiva. Um, so I'm not, you know, of course the number when we say 29% in a shul, that doesn't inherently mean it was an Orthodox shul. So I don't know how many of them specifically took place, you know, within the Orthodox community. So there's a little bit of, um, you know, ambigu ambiguity in that statistic, but I can say, you know, I think there's, again, it's, 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 there, there's a, how do I want to say this? I guess on one side, you know, you, you have leaders across the, you know, Orthodox world that have come out and said, you know, please don't kiss mezuzahs, you know, about minions, kind of really taking these proactive steps that says like, let's, 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 you know, take care of our community. Um, but I think, you know, I, I guess like in a very different example, there was someone uh, on the beach yesterday who was getting yelled at by the police for going swimming after they said no swimming. It was an older gentleman. Police officer goes, you're not allowed to swim. And he goes, oh. He goes, but you knew that. He goes, yeah. He goes, why did you swim? He goes, because I swim here for the past 64 years of my life. Why would I stop today, right? And it was a really, it was a really like heartfelt answer. He's like, I've literally woken up every morning in my life for 64 years and gone swimming. Why would I not? And I think in the same way, you know, for people that engage in a certain lifestyle and they're, you know, they're, they're used to going to the Mm. The issue, and they're studying in Khabruta day in and day out, I think it's also hard sometimes to break those routines. And so that's a complete, like, me interpreting the situation. But, um, you know, I, I, I think there's been great, you know, steps taken to, to, to protect the community. But I also think that, you know, when you look statistically, like, again, it was 29% in this show and 4% were, were yeshiva. So it's a pretty, you know, that's over a third of the population that mm. were infected in Israel by some Jewish institution of some sort. Talk about having empathy for someone's life circumstances that they're going through and the ways that they, they deal with their routine. I think we all know what it's like to experience being pushed um, outside of the norm of our routines and our, our typical comfort zones that we're, we're all being challenged by right now. Yeah, I feel for that, for that guy who just wants to go swimming. <laughs> for sure. Um, so I think I'm, I'm watching the time and I want to be conscious of everyone's, of everyone's day and feeling grateful that people joined us today. We have a lot of people logged on. This will be our last question, so, so you have an opportunity here. Uh, the question here is there's a lot of sensationalist media out there, um, and so in your opinion as an epidemiologist, what is some info that we might be missing from a lot of the media that we're consuming on a regular basis? Is there anything that you could tell us that we're not seeing on the typical news channels? Yeah, I mean, I guess, so to me, if, I guess if I go back to like where epidemiology came from, right, epidemiology of field was about how do we translate what's happening like in bench science and make sure the data is good and then imply that, you know, or employ that for policy recommendations. And so mm -hmm. I think there's kind of this disconnect between what's happening sometimes on the ground and policies and like really how do we create that connection. So 
you know, I'll, 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 I'll pick a local example here in Tel Aviv. It's awesome that the government's taken such a proactive step. And I think pretty much most people around the world uh, would, would agree that, um, you know, Israel, Israel definitely was, was one of the most proactive countries on the onset. But what happens when citizens don't follow those recommendations and they bring their like, you know, iPod, you know, their iPhone and speakers, and they're having like a, you know, a picnic on the beach with like six of their friends. So right. you can have the best policies, but if people aren't following them, it, it changes the equation. And so I think, um, you know, I think the sensationalized news is a result of, we know the best practices, but we have a challenge collectively, globally, not any country, not any city, but how do you actually implement and employ those recommendations in a way that's best for the people where we're respecting people's civil liberties and respecting people's rights, mm. but we're also doing it in a way that's best for the, the common, you know, the, the, the common good there. And so I think it's, it's really this clash of almost this like utilitarianism of the greatest good and like kind of that deontological approach of like what's best for the individual in that situation and kind of thinking through how we put that together. So I think sensationalized news, um, it's based in a potential reality, uh, but I don't think it's the most probable or likely reality. I think it's really about us coming together, supporting each other, following what we should do, and I think we'll get through this together. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by your ability to actually connect everything you just said to the two values that you shared earlier about the branches and the tree and then saving one life as if you're saving the whole world. There's something really powerful in the statement you just made that fully embodies those two things coming to life. What does it actually mean to, to care for every single person individually so that the greater good is actually taken care of? There's, 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 there's brilliance in your wisdom, Josh. Um, I, I am incredibly grateful to be able to have this conversation with you and for the work that you're doing on the ground with JDC globally right now and for the fact that we have an epidemiologist who is our rig fellow this year and for all of the wisdom that you brought to us just wanted to say thank you before Ariel closes us out to you for taking the time and for all of the work that you're doing and for giving me the opportunity to actually have this conversation and for giving our participants who joined us today the opportunity to hear from you thank you yeah and thank you and the entire N20 team for building this intentional community because I think it's really great that we all were able to take the time and invest in it together so thank you Awesome. Thank you both again. My phone is currently blowing up for my friends in Rwanda that I messaged before. Um, so making me feel really good to feel connected to the global world. Um, I want to thank the audience and everybody who joined us. Um, we hope that you will join us next Wednesday for our next Entwine exclusive. Um, we'll be sitting down with Asher Ostrin, uh, who's JDC's interim CEO and Kate Belza, uh, who's an alumna of our programs, and she's also a JDC board member. Um, on March 30th, uh, we're also going to be doing an Entwine Young Professional Spotlight with Joey Leskin, who's an alum of ours, um, who's going to be talking about his year-long service in Turkey. Uh, you can see all of these details, more upcoming events and programs that Entwine is running uh, at the thread at jdcentwine.org. I'll post it in the chat in a second. Um, and lastly, we are creating these virtual programs to help our communities stay connected globally. Um, and we would love to hear what you've learned um, and what you're looking for through this and just how we did on this session. So for you, those of you on Zoom, uh, as soon as I close out, a SurveyMonkey link is going to pop up, um, just asking you a couple of questions and we'll post it on, in the comments on Facebook. Um, yeah, thank you again, everyone for joining us. Stay healthy, um, and we hope to see you on our next program. Bye, Josh and Andrew. Thank you.